is from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 8 through 10. Proverbs chapter 25, verses 8 through 10. Let us hear God's holy word. Do not go hastily to court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor, and do not disclose the secret to another, lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. And from the New Testament, in Luke chapter 12, my text is 57 through 59, but I'll begin reading at 54. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 54, this is God's holy word. Then he said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, the judge delivers you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last mite. To prepare us to hear the word, let us sing Psalm 119M, Psalm 119M. seated. Let us bow together for prayer. Our Father, almighty and everlasting God, we do love your word. We do meditate on your word. Help us to love it more, to meditate it Meditate on it more deeply, and by your Spirit, help us to understand it this morning. By that word, make us wise and give us understanding. Continue to use it to keep us from sin. And now we pray you will convict us in our hearts of what we've done wrong that you will comfort us and remind us of your love and forgiveness and you will point us to your son and help us to always fix our eyes on him. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Life is difficult, but it's more comfortable when we have peace. In this world, there are all kinds of reasons for us not to have peace. But when we do, and in the areas of our lives in which we have peace, life is so much better. Peace between husband and wife, peace between parent and child, peace between teacher and student, friend and friend, most importantly, peace with God. Jesus speaks about peace here in this passage of Scripture. And in this section, the Holy Spirit has directed Luke to tell us about the journey of Jesus to Jerusalem. He's headed there. He is traveling toward Jerusalem for the last week of his life. And for that, that appointment he has to go to the cross and die that shameful and painful and cursed death to save his people from their sins. And as he goes, as he travels, he's traveling with his apostles, he is teaching his apostles, he is teaching the crowds along the way, he's meeting various people, he's talking about various subjects, but he is preparing his disciples for his departure. He is telling them that they are going to suffer. He is telling them that he, uh, he is going to suffer, and they don't understand that yet. He's already broken the news to them. He has said, I will be put to death, and I will rise again. But it hasn't really dawned on them yet. They're trying to understand it. He's trying to help them. And there are others whom he instructs in the crowds along the way. And previously, in verses 54 through 56, he has said to them, to the crowd, you understand the weather in this geographic location. You understand that if clouds arise in the west that you're going to have showers. You understand that if wind blows from the south, it's going to get warmer. Well, in fact, that's the same with us, isn't it? Usually, the westward, westward winds from the west, I should say, bring us rain. Usually, the gulf winds bring us more warmth. And then he says, you discern that, but you don't discern this time. You don't discern, you don't understand that the time has come for the kingdom of God to come on this earth in a new stage with my coming. You don't understand, you don't discern this time that the Messiah has come and that I am He. There were things that they did not discern. And He was giving them a final warning. And in 40 years or so, Jerusalem would fall because most people did not believe him. And that would be God's judgment on that city. And he's also preparing the disciples, as I mentioned. So he begins this section by asking, why do you not judge what is right? And then he talks about peace. Making peace with someone who has or is about to charge you with an offense, which leads the people, or should lead the people, and should lead us to think about bigger concerns of peace, especially our peace with God. So this morning I speak to you on the subject, make peace, under these three headings. First of all, judge what is right. Secondly, settle before going to court. And thirdly, make peace with God. So first of all, judge what is right, he says in verse 57. 
Yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? We have not judged rightly concerning Jesus. And as I mentioned earlier, many, most people of the first century did not judge rightly concerning Jesus. They did not consider him to be the Messiah he was. They did not consider him to be the Savior he was. In fact, they saw him cast out demons and they accused him of casting out demons by the power of the devil himself. And they thought that the Messiah, when he did come, many of them, most of them thought, that this Messiah would bring civil peace and release them from under the power of the Romans. And this is what they were looking for, but they did not read their Bibles, their Old Testament, closely. They did not understand it as it was written. And what do people think about Jesus today? Many of the same things and other errors. I was interested to find this article of all places on catholicstand.com. This article entitled, Does Amazon's Alexa Say Jesus Christ is a Fictional Character? by Jean Van Son, December 2nd, 2017. According to a video posted November 24th, 2017 by Steve Crowder's YouTube channel, Louder with Crowder. Crowder asked Alexa, who is the prophet Mohammed? Alexa answered, the prophet Mohammed is a very wise prophet. He taught many people how to live, had a wife called Anisha, I'm sorry, Aisha. He lived in Saudi Arabia. The message he gave to the people is pray to Allah. He is the only God, and he gave them holy corn, end of quote. Then Crowder asked Alexa, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? And Alexa answered, Jesus Christ is a fictional character. That was in 2017. Now, I don't know what Alexa answers now. I haven't had a conversation with Alexa recently or ever, but that's what she said once. Sometimes we Christians have a distorted understanding of Christ also, at least for periods of time. We judge that Jesus is loving, and he is. But many times we forget what it means to love him. For he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's easier to remember his love for us than to practice our love for him, isn't it? We judge Jesus to be gentle, meek, and mild, and he is. And we're thankful that he said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a precious teaching of Jesus to us, and it's real. But do we remember the Jesus that went through the temple with a whip? Do we remember the Jesus that cast out the traitors in the temple who were taking advantage of the people making sacrifices? Do we remember that Jesus? Do we remember the Lamb of God spoken of in Revelation 14, verse 10, which says of the non-believers, of those who worship the beast, quote, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, Revelation 14, 10. And verse 11 goes on to say, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name, Revelation 14, 11. Do we take in the whole Jesus? 
I've heard it said that men have gotten softer in America over the past years. I believe our view of Jesus is that he is softer too. We do need to remember that Jesus is loving and kind. We certainly need to remember that. But he's more than that as well. We have not judged rightly concerning the way to salvation sometimes either. Many people in the first century believed in salvation by works, and they were opponents of Jesus. The scribes and Pharisees thought they were good. They thought they were righteous. They even, not only did they think they obeyed the law of God in the Old Testament, they added to the law of God and thought they obeyed that. And outwardly, they did many good things, no doubt. But they didn't practice the spirit of God's law. They didn't obey God with their hearts. They believed in self-salvation. They believed they saved themselves by their good works. But we know that even our best deeds on our best days are tainted with sin. Jesus was trying to tell the people that they were sinners and they needed to repent. The way to salvation is not by works, but by grace through faith. And then God leads us and enables us to do some good works. Furthermore, we have not judged ourselves rightly. In this case of the man being taken to court, he had not judged himself rightly. And we often don't either. It's easy for us to underestimate how wicked we can be. I know this is hard to hear. I don't take delight in saying this. I think we don't often realize how much we deserve God's wrath and punishment. We are rebels at heart. That's the way we're born. And after we're born again, by God's grace, thank him. We still struggle all our lives against these temptations. It's our inclination. Thank God he gives us his spirit, and the spirit fights against the flesh, and we thank him for that. There's a hymn that says, we have not known thee as we ought. We have not feared thee as we ought. We have not loved thee as we ought. Even after our conversion, we still sin. We're saved sinners. We still sin. And we are to strive toward improvement. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 say, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. The only way to salvation is Jesus. This is what he was teaching in the first century. This is what the word of God is teaching us now. And we must trust him to save us and to keep us and to sustain us after our conversion with all those temptations and with all those things that would take peace from us. We continue to trust him. That's the only way. First of all, Judge what is right. Secondly, settle before going to court. And this is what Jesus is saying in verses 58 and 59. Settle by admitting you are wrong. And this is what is taught in this case. If someone has a case against you, in verse 58, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort 
along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge. The judge deliver to the, you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. So you're on your way. You've been accused. And you're still open to conversation with your opponent. So it's best that you think about this. And if you're guilty, to go ahead and admit it and settle it before you go to court, and things get a lot worse. In this case, apparently, the person is guilty. And so, he should avoid going to prison, avoid going to court, and settle out of court. And this has a spiritual application. Whoever has sinned, has made God his or her enemy. God has a case against us, and he's right, and we're in the wrong. And so the best thing to do is to settle before we stand before the judge, and it's too late, because then we will be thrown into the prison of hell for all eternity. The wages of sin is death. And if the sinner continues on this same course without admitting his wrong and seeking forgiveness, that's what he deserves and what he or she will get. So settle up with God, admit your sin and confess it is the message of Jesus. Now we see a lot of scandal in this nation, a lot of scandal relating especially to politics. And you know, the question comes to mind, does, does anyone who is a public figure in this nation ever admit that he or she has been wrong? And the answer is usually not. <laughs> usually there's someone else to blame, especially when you have all these people working under you. And if you're of one political party, you can always blame the other political party We are, in spite of the fact that in other areas of life we, not be, we may not be creative, when it comes to making excuses for what we've done or not done, we are really creative. We can come up with them at will. Admitting we are wrong is something that's really, really hard to do. And it's not only difficult for celebrities and politicians and people who are well known in the press and in the news, but it's difficult for us. It's difficult for every human being to do this. And nowadays, aren't you thankful that you're not a celebrity? I mean, would you like for every little bit of your life to be exposed in public? But with cameras everywhere and phones everywhere, if you do something wrong, you know, it's likely to be recorded. Somebody's going to have that thing rolling. But even if they don't, God knows us even better. He knows not only everything we've done and the things we've done in private that other human beings haven't seen, he knows every thought we've thought. If we have not even expressed it. He knows it. We cannot hide from him. So we might as well just go ahead and swallow our pride and admit we're wrong and confess our sins. So settle by admitting your sin and then settle now. For the longer we delay, the worse it gets. Don't wind up in prison. Settle out of court. Don't wind up in hell. Repent now while we can. And I was thinking of Psalm 32. Think of the effect of David's sin on himself. And then think of the effect of sin on your life. Psalm 32, 3 and 4. When I kept silent... He did not confess his sin. 
when I kept silent. Psalm 32, 3 and 4. My bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Psalm 32, 3 and 4. He kept silent. He did not admit his sin. His bones grew old. You know what it's like to have an aching in your bones, probably? Not good. Because of his guilt, you see, because of his guilt, he had an aching in his bones. He was groaning all day long because of his guilt. His vitality was taken from him, his energy, because of his guilt. What affects our soul affects our body and vice versa. We're a unit, soul and body. And the one affects the other. David committed this sin, you know, with Bathsheba. He took another man's wife. She was impregnated by him. So he had to hide that. And you know what he did. He went so far as to tell his military commander, put her husband on the front lines and withdraw from him, which was done. Her husband was killed. David tried other ways to avoid the publicity, but this man, Uriah, was such a good man. Death resulted. And so for at least nine months, for nine months plus, David carried this sin. And you see what it was doing to him in Psalm 32. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David. And Nathan tells David this little story about a poor man who had one little lamb that was so precious to him. He fed this lamb by hand. He held this little lamb in his lap. It was the only one he had. And so a neighbor, rich man, had all kinds of animals. But a visitor came to the rich man's house, and what did he do? He took the poor man's lamb from him and used it to feed the visitor. And Nathan, David was infuriated when he heard this story. And he said, that man deserves to die. And, of course, that's when Nathan said, you, David, you are the man. And the impact of that hit David very hard. David repented. He confessed his sin. But listen to what Scripture says. Well, first of all, in 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, here's what it says. 2 Samuel 11, verse 27. And when her mourning was over, that is Bathsheba's, when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that he had done displeased the Lord. 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven. 27. So David had hidden it from other people, but not from God. And then after Nathan confronted David, or as he confronted David, we read this in 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 10. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, 
the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 10. Those words are powerful words that the Lord sent to David. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Read the rest of the history of David in the Old Testament, and you'll see it. Starting with the death of that child. Was David still a child of God? Yes, he was. He was. And God forgave him. But there are consequences. The longer you and I delay to confess our sins, the worse it gets. Repent now is the message. Settle because the consequences are severe. In verse 59, I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last mite. Or we would say, till you have paid the very last penny. Scribes and Pharisees and many others should settle their differences with Jesus. Every sinner should settle his or her differences with the Lord. Because there are severe consequences if we don't. We who are Christians need to repent regularly. You know this. It's a part of our worship services. It's part of our private devotions. It's a regular part of our lives, or it should be. It must be. Our relationship with the Lord will deteriorate when we ignore our sins. Our growth in grace will stop. We will begin to backslide. And you know that, that law of physics, a body in motion tends to, can, tends to continue to be in motion. A body at rest tends to continue to be at rest. If we're progressing, we tend to progress. But our sins slow us down. Whatever that sin is, whatever those sins are that so easily beset you, target them. Repent of them now. Ask God the Holy Spirit to help you turn from them. They are hurting you. They are hurting others. They are not glorifying God. But he'll forgive you. And he'll set us back on the right path. So secondly, settle before going to court. Thirdly, make peace with God. This is implied in this whole story. Thirdly, make peace with God. God has a case against us. He is the judge and we are the guilty. We owe him obedience. We owe him repentance. We are debtors to God. He holds us accountable unless the matter is settled. We will be punished. People who don't make peace with God will be punished. Remember, remember Psalm 2. Kings and rulers take counsel together. They rise up against the Lord and his anointed. They rebel against him. And what does God do? God says, oh, no. <laughs> of course not. God laughs. God laughs at someone that would rebel against him. Like a gnat taking on a bull. Kings, rulers of the earth, the ruler of the largest nation in the world is no threat to God. No problem to God. The biggest sinner, the smallest sinner is no trouble with God. And so Psalm 2 talks about this. And God says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. 
In Psalm 2, 11 and 12, we, we read, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Psalm 2, 11 and 12. We're blessed if we put our trust in him. We are cursed if we don't. We cannot fight against the Lord and win. We must make peace with him or suffer the consequences. If you're a professing believer, you cannot hide your secret sins from him, and I cannot, and we must repent. The Lord is right, and we are wrong. He's in control, and we are not. If we don't make peace with God, we will be punished. But when we are brought to our senses by the Holy Spirit of God, when we come and confess our sins before Him, when we are in sincere in our repentance, the Lord is gracious to forgive and loving and willing to receive us and to give us the strength to obey. Again, Psalm 32 talks about how David was relieved when he did confess his sin. Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and the Lord forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, verse 5. And then Psalm 32, verses 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, that is to the people who do not repent. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 32, 10 and 11. What a relief when David repented. What a relief when you did. What a relief when I did. And when we continue to repent. God says, I forgive. I forgive. He forgives. When we repent, we have peace with God. How is that possible? That someone who is totally in the wrong totally deserves punishment in hell forever can be forgiven. How is that possible? Human beings, we find it so hard to forgive one another. How is that possible? It is possible only through Jesus. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross. That's the good news. He died to save his people from their sins. He arose from the grave that we might have forgiveness, a clean slate before God. White as snow. Our sins washed away as white as snow. Though they be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I could not do that for you. You could not do that for me. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, But God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. 2 Corinthians 5.19 We have peace with God if we are believers, if we truly repent. But there are things along the way that destroy, that mess up that peace temporarily. Something comes our way that we don't like. Something crosses us. This is not the way I want my life to be. 
I don't want this physical condition. You mean I have to live with this for the rest of my life? So this is going to be a part of my relationship with my friend or my spouse or my child or my parent. Lord, is this what you're doing to me? Is this in your providence? Where's the peace? <laughs> we don't feel the peace. We don't sense the peace. But my friends, we have to make peace with that too. The peace is still there. What's wrong is that we're not accepting it. We're wanting things to be another way. We're frowning at God's providence. Sometimes I frown at it too. And that's not good. Because God knows what he's doing. And he grants us peace with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. So make peace with God even in the difficult times. Make peace with God by repenting of your sins and putting your trust in Jesus Christ and by living that way every day by His grace and the power of the Spirit. So then, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you that your son Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We thank you that by your Spirit we find peace in Jesus. Forgive us when that peace is disrupted by our sin and help us. Lord, help us to accept that peace and continue to live in it and make us agents of peace for the sake of others. Amen.